This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of Puck Poolies presented by ProLine. It's Matt Larkin here, as always, with my buddy Stephen Ellis. Stephen, how you doing? What's the latest in the four-team league? Well, uh, I'll tell you, my, I'm... I'm in a 16 team league too. And that one I've kind of sold off everything. I'm just trying to lose as, as much as possible. Something that you've even said, you don't want people doing Like I'm trying as hard as possible to lose every single game. When there's players that are in the lineup, uh, I make sure to not use them and put the guys who are not playing in the lineup instead. And the idea is that I really want Connor Bedard that badly. Um, but uh, in my 14 league, I was on a two uh, week losing streak. I finally caught back up, crushed the team I was playing. And now I'm playing the second place team. And to kind of show you how competitive these can be, uh, the second and third place team, they've when they've met up with each other, the battles have been basically decided in the last hour on Sunday um, of, of gameplay. So it gets pretty close when uh, you have so much skill and so much talent. But for me to go back there and finally win after a couple of tough weeks was nice. Uh, I still need some of my guys to step up a bit. I don't believe Tage Thompson really helped me as much as I was hoping for in the pool, but uh, goaltending was good. I uh, went to Arizona to pick up a certain goalie that really helped me and because uh, he faces a lot lot of shots and uh yeah kind of out of still in a good spot here okay i'm in a good spot too i've won five weeks in a row seven out of eight so i'm in in first place in my division now rising up uh but it's funny that the tank situation in my league continues to loom over everything because we reset like after covid we reset all the contracts in our league because it's sort of the season ended and it caused a lot of controversy so we decided to just start over we have three year contracts for all players so everybody drafted in year one of that cycle is going back in the pool next year which means Connor mcdavid austin matthews all the elite elite players so it's the ultimate year to tank and there's one guy he's got three first round picks he's lost every matchup so it's it's week 16 i think of the season now and he's 0 and 15. and when you get to play him it's like i'm i finally get to play him next week i can't wait because our standings aren't determined by single win loss it's it's the categories right so if you win 13 nothing that's 13 wins in your standings so i need that matchup i'm hoping i can get a huge jump in the standings next week so that'll be a nice little treat uh but let's launch in now and, and talk pickup steven all right let's start with the shallow league pickup of the week and it is jeff petrie Yes, and this might be a temporary pickup in shallower leagues, but it's still an important pickup. So Jeff Petrie, last I looked, was available in 45% of Yahoo leagues. In a deeper league, a banger format, he's a year-round own because he kind of contributes to everything. He gets a lot of hits and blocks. He plays a lot of minutes. He can still contribute a bit of offense. He shoots the puck a decent amount as well. But right now, you're seeing some true relevance, even just as an offensive contributor who can be a high-end fantasy defenseman because, of course, Chris Letang is still out. He is practicing with the Penguins, but he's not wearing a contact jersey yet, as far as I can see or last I checked. So we have Jeff Petrie on the top pair at the moment and the top power play unit. So you're still going to get all those banger stats he always brings, but the offense should be spiking for as long as Chris Letang's out. So that can be someone, especially in a head-to-head format, could help you win a couple matchups until Chris Letang is ready to come back. Cool. All right. I like that one. The medium pickup this week is Anton Lindell, one of my favorite uh, young centermen in the NHL, a guy you don't want to mess with. And I feel like I pick him. I don't know if you've ever done the Tim Hortons, like picking like the three players each day to score to get a week of free coffee. Every time Lindell's an option, I pick him. He doesn't t- oops. He doesn't typically uh, pay off for me, but I did win coffee because of him once. So I can say that was okay. The coffee man, yeah, sure. That's reason enough to pick him up, but also he's going to help you just in regular fantasy formats. Last I looked, he was available in 71% of Yahoo leagues, and he has been a little bit banged up. So his first 39, 40 games, it was something like 20 points that he had. Uh, but he's on that line now with Alexander Barkov and Sam Reinhardt. Barkov, I remember talking to him after the game when they were in Toronto last week, and he was really seeing the praises of Lundell and Reinhardt, just how intelligent they are as line mates. So that's just a really smart line, factoring in Barkov's IQ as well. Of course, people kind of called Lundell the mini Barkov, has a lot of similarities in his game, also a lot of skill to go with the defensive reliability and that first round pedigree. So going into last night's action, he had three goals and five points in a four game stretch. So I know we're seeing Sam Reinhardt's ownership spike as well because that line is really heating up, but Lundell's more the sleeper of the trio. And I think 
he's capable of getting hot for an extended stretch. So I could see him doing something like 20, 25 points in his next 30 games in a medium-sized league. That's going to be someone who can help you. All right, we're going to go deep league here. And this one's kind of an interesting one. It's really great. And that's a very deep one because he just got called up. But this is a guy that I don't know if it's a record, but he I don't know if any other player that got suspended before they played their very first uh, regular season game. But he did that because of a preseason game. And if you saw him play at the World Juniors last year, you know people do not like playing against him. And uh, yeah. he's in, like this little ball of energy. And uh, he's one of my favorite young prospects. But why do you like him as a deep league pick? Well, the ball of energy factor, that is what I think is going to make him fantasy relevant. So I actually just picked him up like 10 minutes ago, right before we started this episode, um, because I'm in that super deep deep league, and he's available in 100%, although I just picked him up, so it's got to be 99.99999% of leagues. Uh, We know, of course, Josh Norris, the devastating blow earlier this week, re-injures that shoulder. He's out for the season. And really, Greg gets called up. Uh, He did not look overmatched in the AHL, had 12 goals, 23 points in 28 games, so looking comfortable as a pro. And we know, of course, Shane Pinto, when Norris was previously out, was getting that chance on that second line with Alex Dabrink and Claude Giroux, but Pinto had been really streaky. I think there's still an opportunity to steal that spot. And the scuttlebutt was that Greg was getting some looks in practice with to bring in and Drew. So it sounds like he is going to debut on that second line. And of course, there's potential for offense there. Greg has some legitimate prospect pedigree, first round pick. But to go back to what you said, Stephen, he's a feisty character. He mixes it up. So I'm predicting this is going to be someone who records a lot of hits. I think Greg's going to be a guy who's going to get some shots, but he's also going to be a reliable contributor to banger formats. So you have offensive upside. You have someone playing with high school players starting his career in the top six and with some nice ability to probably contribute hits as well, I'm intrigued. I think that could be someone who helps you in many different categories. I like it. Now, the WTF pick of the week is Trevor Zegers, and that one's interesting because uh, literally just got a notification saying he was dropped in my league. So it's uh, that maybe it's time to pick him up, but why? Is he- yeah, I, I think the plus minus pendulum is swinging too far. Yes, of course, it's really ugly. Minus 23 on the season last I looked, but he's still available in 30% of leagues. This is someone who can produce like an elite fantasy player for extended stretches. He has, of course, that really magical talent. Last year down the stretch, he was really strong. He had, a, I think it was after the All-Star break, he was almost a point per game. He's got 15 points in his last 12 games, 13 points in his last 10. So if you're able to stomach that plus minus, there's no reason why he shouldn't be rostered in almost every league because he's someone who in his final 35 games of the year could easily get 45 points. That could be someone who's even a league winner for you if he's available. So if you can handle that, it's hard. Plus minus, I know it really knocks a lot off his value. I'm in a keeper league where I'm trying to offer him to some of the seller teams, but that plus minus is scaring them away, which I think is silly because it's a keeper league. It doesn't mean he's going to have a bad plus minus next year, especially if he's playing with Connor Bedard. But I digress. Point being, just because a guy has bad plus minus doesn't mean he can't help you. And I think Trevor Zegers can. The skill level's high. And I think his point production is going to stay point per game or maybe better for the rest of the season. I'm glad you mentioned Connor Bedard because right now the Anaheim Ducks are uh, number one in the draft lottery ranking. So uh, that will be very interesting to see. Because to me, we, we did this something on the website uh, a while back. It's like, who would you kind of want to see Bedard go and play for? And I said Anaheim because I feel like that team would be a lot of fun. And him and Zegers together would have really good co- uh, chemistry, I think. But there's also Mason McTavish, and let's not forget how good Mason McTavish was with Bedard at the 2022 World Junior. So uh, that would be an interesting one, and you know maybe it sparks some more interest in hockey in California. But the tip of the week, no one to walk away in trade talks. Yeah, and I, I'm actually going to bring Zegers back into this discussion. So I would be an example of, and there's someone like this in every league, there's a GM who just loves trading. It's almost like you get a little dopamine hit and it's a high and other people can exploit that. People know that I love trading and they will dig their heels in and reject offers and knowing my price will come down sometimes because I just want to make the trade and I'm looking for an excuse to make the trade. So they'll wait me out and say, no, this is too much. He'll bring down his asking price. I'm just going to sit there because I know he just wants to make a trade. But there comes a point in which you've got to respect yourself and don't just trade for the sake of trading. You got to know when to walk away from the table. You got to grow a spine because otherwise people will continue to exploit that and eventually you're going to make a mistake. Uh, so the example that I, I can use was this weekend, these Trevor Zegers negotiations. Someone had offered me Cindy Crosby one for one. Cindy Crosby expiring contract in our league. 
And I said, listen, in the last month, Zegers has produced more points, shots, everything than Crosby. I want more. I don't think this is fair if I'm getting the expiring player who's not even producing as much as Zegers. And this GM, who has a history of winning these standoffs with me, said, no, I'm, this is this is my final offer. I'm not giving you any more. And he, I think he believed I was going to cave because I have in the past. But this time I said, no, I think I lose this deal. If I'm giving up the guy with years left on his deal, who's producing the same as the piece I'm getting, how is that fair for me? And I said, no, I want to make this trade. It's tempting. It'd be fun to get Sidney Crosby, but I'm not doing it. So I walked away and I think it was the right decision. And it's just an example of if you're that person like I am that just loves trading, just don't let it get in your way. Know when someone is trying to take advantage of you and walk away from the table. All right. I like it. I guess it's time for our guest. Yes, we're going to be bringing on from NHL.com, the great fantasy expert, Pete Jens. Okay, next up, everybody, we're very pleased to bring in a special guest, a friend of mine, someone I've always respected in the fantasy hockey sector, even though I guess technically he's a rival, but he's a respected rival. It's director and senior fantasy editor at NHL.com, Pete Jensen. Pete, my friend, great to see you again. How are you doing? Great to be with you guys. And yeah, always good to have some other opinions, right? Especially for the rankings, the preseason stuff. Like it's never good enough to look at one list. You got to look at where players differ and why and hear people out and then make your own decision as a fantasy manager. That's the name of the game. But uh, yeah, right back at you, Matt. It's uh, It's been fun to cross paths with you over the years and uh, compare our rankings and see where things shake out you're bang on and it's funny when i do my rankings my rule is like okay i'm gonna look at pete's but I'm, i gotta get my draft down first i don't want to steal anything yeah, so yeah. i do my entire list and then I, I'll, I'll look at yours to cross reference in case i forgot somebody so i always appreciate that uh so pete let's start with just a little bit of background on you um obviously you're one of the heavy hitters in the fantasy hockey sector but i know you have some traditional journalism roots as well went to penn state studied broadcasting so did the fantasy thing kind of come along later in your career trajectory or was it always something you had your eye on i mean when i was in college i was kind of planning to be like a multi-platform media person in whatever sport i landed in i was not planning to work in hockey and i was not planning to cover fantasy i was not you know planning anything in particular but i i'll be honest like coming into my professional career like the other three sports were ahead in the pecking order. I was just like a bigger fan of those sports growing up. I was a big hockey fan. I was a big Sabres and Islander fan growing up, uh, growing up on Long Island and having family up in Rochester. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, no. I mean, it came um, with an opportunity. And I had always played fantasy sports. I played some fantasy hockey in high school. I played fantasy football with my buddies from high school, like everybody says out there all the way back since high school, since it became a big thing. So, mm -hmm. and a little uh, fantasy baseball as well with the same guys. So, you know, I kind of had that background. And then at Penn State, I was able to, you know, kind of, you know, mature in different areas of journalism. And some traditional journalism, like, still pays off for me because I, um, like, last year I got asked to cover multiple games during the Rangers, uh, Stanley, you know, uh, Eastern Conference final run. And that was a blast for me to get back into that. And when I go to events and I cross paths with you at things like, you know, the stadium series or the all-star game and things like that, the NHL draft, like I'm usually doing general stuff in addition to any fantasy spin uh, that I'm doing on that particular event. So, yeah, it's kind of uh, cool to see that still become a big part of my career. But, you know, the fantasy side of things is, is and the betting stuff now, that's like uh, first and foremost now. So I've known Matt for a while, and I know it takes him a while to put together his rankings. You want to be as, as accurate as possible. When you're doing your own rankings, how long does it generally take? I guess it depends on the time of year. During the season, we uh, so in the past, we updated our positional lists only. Then a couple of years ago, we started updating our top 200. We don't do 250 during the season because it's just way too many players and too much volatility, but we do top 200 every week and now this year um we started updating th that list at the beginning of the week right after we do our waiver wire pickups we let the list shake out we do some big picture changes and then in the following days tuesday wednesday thursday and even friday really we update each individual list and then reflect those changes in the 200 list so really now when you look at our list 
uh, with the exception of maybe Saturday, Sunday, Monday, until we make the new changes. Like every other day of the week, it's pretty updated. Like if you see Josh Norris done for the season, we take him out and we uh, make some adjustments to guys like Stutzla or whoever else is going to move up in that situation. You know, Pacioretty's out for the season, unfortunately, with another Achilles injury. We move back up uh, into the mix, uh, Tavo Teravainen and Seth Jarvis. Those are just some examples of like how every single day when the big things are happening, we try to we do try to adjust it. And I think it uh, is definitely a resource. The more that you update those rankings, it's more of a resource to the fans, which is all that matters. Pete, I know, uh, having experienced it myself, everyone is opinionated in the fantasy hockey circle. And, you know, this this player is too high. I can't believe you have this player too low. You, ha- you don't I can't believe this player didn't make your list. So in terms of just year to year, is there one player that you're known for consistently overrating or underrating someone you always have higher than everybody else or someone you always have lower than everybody else? I mean, I'm big on I'm, I am big on. Ch- I'll give them a shout out. Yahoo. They're our partner. I do look at the performance-based rankings because I want to see how important the category coverage is. I'm a big category coverage guy. I'm always tending to rank players like Brady Kachuk and Evander Kane and Chris Kreider and guys like that. You know, the hits coverage, the shots on goal, the power play points. I feel like I'm always ranking those guys maybe a little higher than the pack because I am aware of those performance-based rankings. So, uh, yeah, I feel like I've caught some flack for Brady Kachuk over the years, but you know what can you say at the end of the day? He's a top 15, 20 player at his floor, and we still haven't seen his Senators go out there and make the playoffs. So I'm still waiting for that day where you know the Senators make the playoffs and he's the number one player in all of fantasy, and then I can kind of you know have the last laugh on that one. But and then on the flip side, you know you see some guys that don't necessarily have they might score you know, 70, 80 points like a Patrick Kane or a Johnny Gaudreau, but they don't cover the categories. They'll have like 15 hits on the whole season. So, you know, that's kind of like where I'll maybe have those guys a couple of spots lower and someone will say, you know, how the heck is Patrick Kane not in your top 20? And and that's my reasoning why. And of course, this year, you know, you hope to see Kane traded at the deadline and resurrect his fantasy value a little bit because I am a big fan of the player. But when you start to see the floor of a player um, in those situations, that's that justifies, I think, uh, to an extent, why I might be a couple of spots lower on players like that. Mm-hmm. So we're approaching the stretch one. The fantasy playoffs are starting up soon. Give us three league winner targets, uh, trade or waiver uh, targets you want to acquire. Well, I definitely like Anton Lindell for the Florida Panthers uh, playing up top. I guess you, it's kind of tricky to say up top it's not necessarily the top line right Matthew Kachuk is their best player by far this year but I think it's their best line trio with Barkov and Sam Reinhart I know they got beat up on Monday by the New York Rangers but uh, he had another point and uh, Lindell has been heating up of late switching from center to the wing so I really like him I'll also mention a couple of Buffalo Sabres I'm a big fan of that team and their fantasy uh, value for the rest of the season whether or not they make the playoffs I like UPL in the crease. He's still a little less than 30% rostered last I checked. I know they're still working in some of the other goalies, but I just like his improvement. And Matt, I know we talked about him when you came on our show, NHL Fantasy on Ice. You know, maybe in keeper leagues, you don't know what his trajectory is going to be. But for the rest of this season, I think they put their best foot forward when UPL is in the crease. And then also Victor Olofsson just keeps scoring goals and he's, really ridiculously low roster percentage last I checked. So uh, scored another one last night, uh, ridiculous home road splits where his home goals, he has like more than three quarters of his goals this season have come at home. So look at him for those spots. And he's one of those guys, he's not a top liner. So he doesn't have that name value and that pull where, you know, everyone's all over him right now, but he's got 20 something goals and he he's on fire right now. So yeah, I would look at Buffalo uh, for sure. And then Lundell, we always have to look at those those line trios, right? And what's working, what's not. The Florida trio is definitely working. As always, Pete, on the same page. Earlier in this episode, we had Lundell as one of our top waiver pickups of the week. A couple weeks ago, we were talking UPL in the same segment. So there you go. Uh, I had just one more question for you on this episode. This has been great. Uh, I'm just curious, with the rise of DFS, uh, does your your approach to fantasy change? Do you strategize differently when you're playing DFS versus a traditional type of fantasy game? 
I mean, yeah, different situations. I think like with goaltenders, I'm always erring towards efficiency and season long leagues and save percentage and, and things like that. But um, you look at more save volume, like you'd be more inclined to roll out a Sam Montembo or a Carol Vamelka or guys like that, or Craig Anderson and DFS. Whereas I wouldn't touch those guys for the most part uh, for the rest of the season. If we're talking about that, uh, especially guys from non-contending teams, if you're uh, looking to stack teams for uh, players from the Anaheim ducks, you probably wouldn't do that in season long formats, but yeah, you might do a little Adam Henry, Troy Terry stack or something like that uh, with those guys playing pretty well lately for Anaheim. And yeah, that's kind of like where I would, you know, differ a little bit in my strategy. But overall, it still comes down to category coverage, sometimes a little different categories, right? You'll have some blocked shots or some shorthanded points as opposed to um, season long formats where those are not standard categories. But yeah, between that stuff and then the shot props and things like that, there's a lot of correlation uh, in all these different realms, fantasy betting and stuff like that. So it's been fun to see it go from strictly season long, what, about six, seven years ago to mm -hmm. all these different formats. And then there are free to play games that the NHL has going in different countries. So um, keeps you on your toes and, and you try to, you know, gear it, you gear your, your coverage toward the uh, the categories at hand, right? Like we have, uh, I always love doing like the, the hits uh, blocks guide for preseason drafts. And it makes you a more informed fantasy player when you're aware of the lay of the land. For sure. And uh, I wanted to ask you about the Roto versus head to head debate. I remember this. I'm pretty sure you were in this league. So there was a super league that we were all invited to just from different publications. So I, I believe you were in it too. And it was Scott Pianowski from Yahoo and Scott Colin TSN. It was me when I was with the hockey news. And it, but it was a roto, it was a roto league, and I just I couldn't get into it. And I, that's always my excuse. I didn't do very well, but I was just like, ah, I just found it boring. I I want that head to head strategy. Where do you land? Do you prefer a roto format, traditional, or do you like the head to head? I like head to head. I just like how um, you know, I know that sometimes you'll you'll have a, a great week and you still won't win, and you'll be zero and one, and you'll be like, what am I doing here? But I think it keeps more of the users engaged for the entire season, whereas like you said, in a roto league, you're you get off to a hot start, then you're fully engaged. You're making you're looking at all the categories. Where do I need to improve and all that stuff, and making your your ads as a result of that. Uh, whereas in head to head, you're you're kind of um, you're rolling with the punches, and you're you're still rewarded more times than not when you have great weeks. But that sort of unpredictability, especially when you get to the fantasy playoffs, like that's the most fun to me about fantasy sports and it applies to football as well. Like how many times have I seen, whether it's been me or someone else, a team be like 15 and five in the regular season um, for fantasy hockey. And then, you know, gets knocked out in the first round. Like it just, it just becomes like a fun thing to monitor. And it's kind of like the NFL playoffs and NHL playoffs, right? Like just big upsets or, that's why we uh, that's why we stay engaged. That's why even if you sneak in with the sixth seed or the eighth seed, you, you could be dangerous if you click at the right time. So I would go with head to head. Yeah, I think you're so right, especially the, the variance in fantasy football. I, I was that guy halfway through the season who was like, oh, I need a second quarterback in Superflex. I'm just going to buy low on Justin Fields. Let's see how that goes. Nice. And boom. Next thing I know, I went to the final. So there you go. Awesome. Uh, Pete. This was awesome. Thanks so much. Always fantastic insight. Love checking out your work. Not stealing it, just, you know, just reviewing it as a peer. It's good. You keep me on my toes. You push me to be better. I always appreciate it, and I'm sure we'll have you on again soon. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, anytime, guys. And uh, right back at you, Matt. Love following your coverage, and uh, cool to see you working with Nick. Of course, Nick Alberga and myself are on NHL Fantasy on Ice uh, Mondays and Thursdays, and we also have a betting show on Monday. So go out and check that out. And thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Pete. Awesome stuff from Pete Jensen. And Stephen, it's time to turn the floor back to you and talk prospects. Who is the player you are monitoring closely this week? 
Well, if you're a Canadian World Junior fan, you know a lot about Olin Zellweger, the defenseman. He's an Anaheim Ducks prospect. And, you know, this is a guy that I try to keep it to guys who are very close to being in the NHL when we're talking about this. And I do believe that we will see Zellweger in the NHL next year. He is 19 right now. Uh, he's currently playing with the Kamloops Blazers. He was in a huge, like a mega trade, way more than Shane Ray, way more than pretty much I think any prospect we've seen traded in the CHL um, from Everett to Kamloops. And in Kamloops, he's playing at a pretty much a two-point-per-game pace already. Uh, this is a guy that loves to shoot the puck, and he's got 14 goals already this year, and he's played, I think, 28 games. So you do the math. That's pretty impressive for a defenseman. He gets a lot of power play time. Uh, we saw him at the World Juniors last year. He was the top-scoring defenseman. Uh, this past year felt like it was almost a bit of a kind of a weaker year, and he still had six points. But I'd argue that having Brant Clark there meant you didn't need Olin Zellweger to be this this offensive dynamo every single night. He could play this good defensive game. I think if this is someone who, if he's going out there getting 45, 50 points a year uh, as a defenseman, I think is very likely. And Anaheim's got a really interesting blue line where they've got some of the top uh, prospects kind of in the NCAA and the OHL. Pavel Mintyukov, I've mentioned him already, who um, he's just been crushing the OHL. He's been like the top five of scoring all year long, and he's a defenseman. So this is a blue line that's going to be able to put up a lot of points in the future, especially then if you go out and get a guy like Bedard. But if you don't, maybe you go out there and get Fantilli or, or Michkov or Leo Carlson. So you're going to have these quality forwards up front to work with. And I think having Zellweger being that quarterback piece is going to be very valuable. So definitely keep an eye on him right now. If you can pick him up in your keeper league and just stash him away, I think he challenges for a roster spot next year. Very intriguing. And I remember in the summer speaking to Zegers, I'm, I'm apparently obsessed with Trevor Zegers in this episode, but he was talking about Zellweger. I think he referred to him as that kid. He was like, that kid's awesome, man. That kid is an amazing skater. He's going to be amazing. I'm really curious too, Stephen, what you think about this, because of course you also have Jamie Drysdale, who when he's healthy is going to continue to be a big contributor as a right shot. But do you think those two, Drysdale and Zellweger, like I assume they're not going to get in each other's way. I, I assume they could be complimentary because Drysdale can be more of a puck mover and then Zellweger can be more of a trigger because he's a goal scorer. Do you think that can work well together? I do. I think Zellweger is a guy that like you can kind of count on to be an extra forward out there. And while Drysdale was kind of more like that growing up, I feel like um, – what we saw kind of later last season is a guy that is a bit more defensively responsible than I kind of remember him being in junior where, you know, he was always kind of just the guy that had to do everything. I don't think he'll need to do that in, in Anaheim. And I think they'll probably kind of lean towards like, Hey, let's continue focusing on your own zone play because we do have all these high offense guys who might not be as good defensively in their own zone. So I think Drysdale will be kind of like that more well, like, guarded more well-rounded guy there but mm -hmm. i think if you have him as the guy who's setting up uh zellweger for those one-timers you again that's a that, those are two essential extra forwards out there every time yeah for sure it'll be interesting to see the ducks having a terrible season but their pipeline is starting to get really interesting it's only going to get better after this season as well steven it's time now for our best bets segment presented by proline and I think I was on the Oilers last week. I'm actually on a hot streak. I, I, my first couple times we did the segment, I bombed, but I think I've gotten three or four in a row. I've hit on them, so ka-ching, baby. And this week, I'm going to my ProLine app. I'm looking at the futures just to mix it up. And I noticed the Pacific Division. The Edmonton Oilers have the third best odds right now, despite being on a six-game winning streak, plus 450. And look at the teams that are ahead of them. The Vegas Golden Knights are starting to crumble a little bit. Mark Stone's back injury has resurfaced. It was a big scare after he had it repaired in the summer. And now, I don't know if it's the exact same issue, but either way, anything back-related for him is scary. And you have the Seattle Kraken, who've been an incredible story, but that goaltending tandem, I just don't know for sure if it's going to hold up long-term. Meanwhile, the Oilers, we're going to get into it later in the episode as well, but their goaltending is starting to solidify. you got Vander Kane back as well. And, of course, Connor McDavid being in God mode. And... Uh, I'm kind of wondering if the Oilers are going to keep rising and take this division. They're almost they're almost at the top now. They've almost caught the teams at the top of the division. So I really like the plus 450. Some really nice odds on that bet. Cool. I like that. And, and to kind of to give you a bit more credit, uh, I think it was the very first one you did, and it was something like like a. Uh, you were kind of predicting about seven goals for Los Angeles and in, in Buffalo in this one game. And I remember I was walking through Bass Pro Shops and you sent me a screenshot and it's like, it's zero, zero in the end of the second period. Yep. And it ended up becoming a six, nothing game. Like it almost worked out. 
Okay. Well, I feel a little better then. Like, so it could have been worse. I was close. I could have been, I could have had an amazing record overall, still nice momentum. So we'll try and get the streak going. Uh, just a word from our sponsor, of course, ProLine Plus. It's not just another sports book being the only sports book that gives 100% of profits back to Ontario, back to the government. It has been your local trusted sports book for over 30 years now, offering Ontario sports fans more ways to play in store, online, or take the game on the go with the ProLine app with your favorite sports and events right at your fingertips. Download the ProLine app and bet in-app with ProLine Plus today or head over to ProLinePlus.ca to learn more. So, Stephen, let's switch gears now and tackle some questions, some good ones this week. All right, let's start off with Franton and Raven, one of our favorites. In category leagues, do you put more value on balance guys, even mid to high numbers and blocks, hits, shots, or specialists, insanely high in one, low to mid in others? Yeah, this is a great question. It's something that I constantly try to weigh, and it really applies to fantasy baseball as well. So I think in hockey, it can be okay to have a specialist, but they have to be incredible in a category. They, they can't just be someone who's decent. They have to be the best. So an example being a few years ago, Radko Gudis had that insane season where he was getting 10 hits every single game. And I, I don't know if he set the NHL record or because he might have gotten suspended, or, but he came close. And his hits per game was just tracking for somewhere in the 400s. So in that case, he was kind of a one category player, but he was single handedly winning you hits because he again 10 hits in a game. So that would be a case where you can make that exception. But otherwise, I definitely lean more to well rounded players. So someone like a, a Joel Erickson Eck or a Sam Bennett or a Darnell Nurse, Jacob Truba, Brady Kachuk, guys like that, as Pete Jensen alluded to as well with Brady Kachuk, they can just help you everywhere. It's really handy in head to head. It makes you real makes you really hard to beat. If you're competitive in every category, I, I always say you'll you'll lose small, but you'll win big. And a specialist can help you, but sometimes the trade-off isn't worth it. If, if they're so one-dimensional, they can drag you down in so many other categories that they're actually a liability. If there's a player who's great in one category, but he hurts you in seven, is that really worth it? I think that's someone who could actually be kind of an anchor that pulls your team down. So I would say well-rounded better unless it's a specialist who's just off the charts. The equivalent of in fantasy baseball, the only player in the league that can steal 60 bases or something like that. If you had a player like that, then fair enough. I think one of the like much deeper example of that for me would be Marc Andre Bergeron, who would get a ton of power play points, but wasn't really great at five on five and was actually on the ice for a lot of goals against. And that was back when using plus minus. And it's like, okay, well, this guy gets, but if he's not scoring on the power play, if they're not getting those power play opportunities, he's not very valuable to me in fantasy. But when he's thriving on the power play, it's a different story. And this would have been around maybe a little bit after when Montreal was always good in the power play. And it was like Sheldon Surrey mm -hmm. would be this, this super amazing power play piece. And Andre Markov was always really reliable. You could always count on those two bringing in a lot of points in the power play. But when the power play wasn't working, it's like, okay, I'm actually just, these are a waste of roster spots to a point. Uh, next question comes from Oil Country 99. Does Jack Campbell's recent play make you a believer in him again? That's an interesting one. So I've said this before. I, I'm proud of this theory because I think it's dead on. Uh, Jack Campbell is Brian Elliott. And <laughs> they both are, they suffer from what I call backup quarterback syndrome. In their careers, whenever there's no pressure on them, whenever they are the 1B who can come in and, and spell the 1A who's struggling or hurt, they are fantastic. Like Brian Elliott literally set a modern day save percentage record at the time in, in 2012. Uh, when he was coming in as the conquering hero who had no expectations on him, every time Brian Elliott was given a chance to be a starter in his career, he flops. And Jack Campbell, it's the same. His rise with the Leafs, his rise with LA before that, the pressure was not on him. He was the guy rescuing the team when Frederick Anderson was hurt or struggling. As soon as he needed to be the guy, as soon as he was being discussed as a Vezina Trophy candidate last year, he went in the tank. And then again, signing that big contract, $5 million bucks a year, you're being paid to be a star. You're being paid to be the guy. Now, all of a sudden, who's the all-star? Stuart Skinner. Stuart Skinner makes the all-star team. Jack Campbell goes 5-0 and with a 922 save percentage in his last five games. The pressure is off. He's being treated like the 1B, and suddenly he's great again. And I don't think it's any secret that Jack Campbell has been his own worst enemy throughout his career. He has mental hurdles he has to get through. He's very hard on himself. So in this case, the intangibles, the mental part of the game, it really does define the type of goaltender Jack Campbell is. And... Basically, I'd say, can we trust Jack Campbell? If Stuart Skinner stays good, then yes. If Skinner's playing well and he's staying in the starter's role, and I think there's less pressure on Campbell. If Skinner falters and suddenly Campbell's elevated to being the guy they really need again, I think his game's going to go in the tank again. So 
I would still tread carefully. I think we've seen the pattern. It's not like he's 22 years old. We know who he is at this point. He's a talented goaltender who has trouble staying out of his own way. Right now, the situation is optimal for him because the other goaltender is playing well and sort of holding down the pressure of being the number one. So just for some more statistical uh, looks here. So Jack Campbell, at the time of recording this, has won his last five games. But his 5-on-5 five five save percentage, according to natural stat trick, is .912, which is not very good. Uh, Stuart Skinner, though, is one position higher, but he's only played one game, and so that's not big of a difference. Uh, I guess if you're a Leafs fan, you're looking at this and say uh, of the goalies that have played at least five games uh, since January 11th, which is when that little run started, Ilya Samsonov is number three in uh, save percentage and uh, goal saved above average. Mm. So, I don't know. But, so, so Campbell's numbers are still not incredible, but he's getting wins. And I guess that's truly what matters more than some advanced stats in terms of fantasy. So uh, you're not looking at five and five save percentage if you're in your Yahoo fantasy league. Mm -hmm. uh, next question comes from Sam Mills. What's the deal with Matt Barzell? No points in seven games. And I don't know if he got a point last night against the Leafs. Yeah, with Barzell, I feel like that's a question we ask pretty much every year since that tremendous rookie season he had when he had 85 points. Um, it, it's just a case of this is a player for whom the output never quite matches the talent. You see Matt Barzell with the puck on his stick in three on three. He's ragging the puck. He's so talented. He always looks like a player that should be a 90 point guy. And he always ends up, you know, whether it's 68 point 70, whatever that range is, he always seems to fall short. And he's more of a B plus type of fantasy player. And it's, it's hard to define what the reason is. This year, I know he's had uh, some weird line mate luck. Last I checked, it was like eight different wingers have played with him, so it's hard to get in a rhythm. That could be the source of this mini slump. But if you look under the hood at his five-on-five -five play driving metrics, they're not alarming or impressive. They're just the same. They look almost exactly the same as his career norms. So I know his pace was more promising a couple of weeks ago. It was, it was looking like he was going to finally get back to the 80-plus point range, but it's not who he's been. And the underlying numbers suggest it's the same Barzell, even with the coaching change. Good player, probably slightly better real-life player, but just not an elite fantasy player, even though he is really talented. I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe you need to see Barzell get to play with a truly elite goal scorer. Like if you ever had a 50 goal guy on his line, maybe he finally breaks through, but he doesn't have that right now. So I think it's going to be 70 point Barzell yet again. All right. That's it for the question. Starting lineup time. Okay. So for the starting lineup, for a little context, because I don't know if it's come up on puck poolies before it probably came up back in our hockey news days, but Steven, uh, has has some interesting biology in the sense that he can handle extreme heat when it comes to food because he doesn't have a traditional sense of smell. So he can be the guy who comes in and dominates a hot sauce drinking contest, whatever it is. But I want to know what foods can manage to cut to the core of you, Stephen, and still titillate you, still have enough flavor you can enjoy them, if any. So give me your starting lineup of foods Stephen Ellis actually can enjoy. So for further context, uh, so I have anosmia, which is where you, you have no ability to smell anything. And so my taste buds are definitely a little bit different than everybody else is. And so if you ever had COVID, I haven't, but you complain about the lack of, of taste and lack of smell. I have that all the time. So it, which is actually really nice in a lot of cases. Um, but that means I kind of have to get a little creative with food. Um, so one of the foods, types of food I eat a lot of, or I like a lot is Indian food, because they're typically a little bit more spicy. I'm a big fan of curry. There's a, a roti place near me uh, that I love to go and get, um, which is usually lamb curry. It's fantastic. It's got enough of heat. Uh, number two, I'd say to continue with that is actually lamb. There's a lot of meat that will not have a lot of kind of flavor to it. Um, like chicken to me is is fine. Uh, that's kind of just like a staple, but then you'll go out there and get turkey. To me, I, I think turkey sucks. It's one of the most overrated things. The only thing I can get at a turkey that has any taste is the the legs. And even then it just, it gets fine. There's so many better things than turkey. Um, so I will go flam though. I think that one's actually got a lot of flavor to it. Uh, number three is a new one that I'm really liking, duck. Um, and, uh, so again, this is just going to be kind of a, a really strange one, but duck's been a really good one. Um, a couple of Chinese food places that I've been to, uh, number four is most sausages have kind of enough, like, um, just enough, enough spices inside of it. Like, I don't want to go out there and just say like nachos or tacos and just things that are combinations of things. Like it's gotta be something one, like a specific food. Mm -hmm. Um, but sausages are typically pretty good. Um, but I do have to put like a lot of, um, a lot of hot sauce on things. Uh, number five, I'll go with pad thai. 
uh, is probably again, one of my favorite foods where, uh, when I'm sick, I still really like it. Um, where, um, cause when I get sick, my taste buds even get a little weaker. Um, so it's something where that's kind of a, a nice one to have. And, uh, number six, I'll, I'll keep it really simple. I'll keep it pizza. Uh, and I know I kind of just broke one of the rules I just mentioned, but, uh, that's one where my favorite type of thing to have on pizza is, is jalapenos, banana peppers, and of all things, anchovies. Uh, that's one thing where I think anchovies are good. I also am a big fan of escargot. Um, I think that's more of a texture thing. If you like mushrooms, I know a lot of people don't. I think you'll like escargot. Whenever I go to Quebec, I make sure to get uh, escargot on pizza. But uh, yeah, I'd say that's kind of my unique list of food. Okay, it's a good list. And and for anyone listening, we've been trying for a long time to try and get Stephen to become a ringer and enter like many hot sauce I have, I have, I have. There's, 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 he's won before, but I, I think it should, this should become a full career for him. I think he could, well, I mean, I guess I'm exposing him now, but if he could have kept this a secret, he could have cheated and just become the greatest hot sauce eating competitor of all time. I will say there's been one thing that has actually beaten me in food. And I can't remember what specifically it was, but it was at Salad King in Toronto near uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. I, I got like the hottest thing they had. And I had done it before and I was like, oh, this is nothing. Like I don't need to drink water. Don't need to drink milk. Nothing. Like I could eat like this. I've ate ghost chili peppers before. Like it doesn't bother me. But then I go out there and had whatever this was at, uh, at Salad King. And oh my God, I like, I, I was going to tables where they had like just like half like, things of water and i'm just like i have to have this or i'm gonna like die at this point and it was like oh my god i felt horrible and i've never had that situation otherwise but i don't go back to that place because it scares me okay so superman does have his kryptonite that was cool and that's the end of this week's episode steven that was a fun one thank you my friend and thank you of course to pete jensen we'll be back next week with more fantasy advice and info I'm